my name is Seth Wiesman. I'm a solutions architect with Ververica. So, uh, yeah, we are the original, the company founded by the original creators of Apache Flink. You may also know us as Data Artisans. We rebranded at the beginning of this year, but we are the same organization. So, along with uh, supporting the open source community, we also offer some enterprise tools, uh, so on. Uh, Flink. Uh, as its name implies, is a top-level Apache project, and we're all about doing stateful computations over data streams. So uh, it's a fairly large framework, contains a number of features, but the thing I really want to focus on for this talk is stateful. Our goal is that you're writing really simple code, the kind of stuff you're doing back in your CS101 course where you're just using local variables and do what seems simple, and we're going to make it stateful, fault-tolerant, scalable, all those good things out of the box. Uh, these are some of the logos from our Powered by page. Uh, Flink's widely deployed across industry, companies large and small. And we are proven out at scale. So these numbers come from Alibaba on Singles Day, which is the largest online shopping day in the world. And everything in Alibaba is powered by Flink. So we were running on clusters with tens of thousands of nodes, doing billions of events per second with sub-second latency, and managing hundreds of terabytes of state within the Flink applications themselves with the confidence that Flink was providing correct, reliable results. Uh, now, Singles Day this year was actually just this past Monday. These numbers are from 2018. I don't have the 2019 numbers yet, but uh, Alibaba increased its one-day revenue by $8 billion, so I expect that these numbers are comparably larger. But I actually don't want to talk about stream processing, at least not quite yet. Instead, I'd like to focus on application development. So this set of logos comes from just a cursory search I did of the Apache Flink mailing list, looking for phrases like, I'm running this stream processing job, and also Spring Boot, or Rails, or whatever it might be. And we see a really wide variety of logos, but that makes sense, because stream uh, application development is a very broad category. However, there's one subcategory of frameworks we've seen a lot of growth in over the past year or so, and that is serverless or functions as a service. Now, I realize these are not strictly the same thing. However, I'm only going to be speaking on them at a very high level, so please don't get too mad if I use these terms interchangeably. Uh, and what is this category at its core? Well, function as a service, as its name implies, is all about building event-driven functions. And I think that's a really interesting place to start thinking about where stream processing and application development might come together, because they both share this very particular characteristic of being reactive to events. And while event-driven is not stream processing by any means, uh, I think it's a very fine line between reacting to a single event and reacting to a stream of events. And one of the most interesting properties that these systems bring to the table is their elastic scalability. So uh, as load increases, a useful function as a service will automatically scale up and spawn more instances so it can handle that load. And when they're no longer needed, those instances will go back down. Uh, this means it has what I'm going to call a very lightweight resource footprint. It only uses what's necessary at any given moment to solve the problem and no more. While that sounds really good, there's also a reason why this hasn't quite taken over the world yet. And that's because most real systems need to do more than simply invoke a single function or do processing based on the information encoded within a single event. Most real systems are stateful. Uh, and once we pull in some data store, a second tier, uh, our story is going to start to fall apart a little bit. We need to start considering things like state consistency. So what happens when I have multiple functions interacting with the database in random ways? When things seem slow, it's very rarely the compute inside the function itself that's our bottleneck. More often than not, it is the interaction between these two layers. We're spending most of our time simply waiting on I.O. to complete. When we really do want to scale the system, right? the compute layer is very simple, but the data layer less so. Modern cloud providers have done a really good job at trying to hide the complexities of scaling data stores, but at the end of the day, it's still a tough problem. And uh, once you reach a certain scale, either in terms of data volume or frequency in rescaling the system, those details are going to leak through and you as the application developer need to deal with it. And this just isn't a smooth experience anymore when we start considering things like connection pooling or how we handle rate limiting across systems and so on. Uh, while these frameworks have made a good start, they're just not ready for building complex stateful applications. 
But of course, none of this is news, right? All you need to do is spend a little too much time on Twitter to see that these are real problems that people are facing in production today. Another somewhat related issue is what happens when we need to do more than simply invoke a single function, right? Your business is made up of a mesh of services that need to communicate with each other in rather arbitrary ways. And we're still missing uh, composition primitives, except in the very particular case of a workflow. Generally speaking, you still need to pull in some extra component, a message queue or event bus, that needs to be managed and used properly to get the correct reliable results that your users expect. So what we're looking for is something that is event-driven, has uh, strong composability characteristics, and shown that state management can be easy. Well, to me, that sounds a lot like stream processing. And certainly that is the Apache Flink view of the world. So we see streaming as a spectrum made up of a whole host of use cases. Everything from really laggy bounded streams or batch processing, all the way to event-driven applications and even transactional systems. But of course, you have very different needs depending where on the spectrum you're working. That's why Flink comes with a number of first-class APIs. So on the one hand is Flink SQL and the table API. We are ANSI SQL compliant, the 2016 standard, and unified over both batch and streaming. Uh, we support the full TPC DS query set, which is a fancy way of saying uh, we support most of the ANSI spec. Uh, and you, know, you can write create table statements and go into our CLI and write things very quickly without you know, any Java or Scala code. But maybe you need a little more low-level control, right? I want to see each record, store value in state, set a callback, make an RPC call, so on. And for that, there's the data stream API. And people have built some really impressive things on top of data stream. But once we move squarely into this event-driven space uh, and transactional applications, even this can feel a little too restrictive. And that's why the Flink community has recently introduced a brand new first-class API called Stateful Functions. So, very excitingly, uh, between the time that I submitted my fr slides last Friday and now, uh, this disclaimer is no longer relevant. So, uh, Stateful Functions is no longer a standalone project. Um, it has been voted on and accepted by the Flink community and is going to be in the main Apache Flink repo and an official first-class API in an upcoming release. That said, this last point is still relevant. Uh, it's still a fairly new API. Uh, it's fast moving. Uh, if you think what I'm talking about today is interesting, it's a great time to get involved. Uh, one caveat, uh, the code still is in that repo, however, uh, at least for the time being. So this diagram gives us a high level overview of building a stateful function application. And at the core are the namesake stateful functions. Think of these as the building blocks for your service. They can message each other in really arbitrary ways. So this is one way in which we're moving away from the traditional stream processing view of the world. Instead of simply saying, uh, we're not building up a data flow DAG anymore, but saying that your functions can message each other uh, in a distributed, arbitrary, potentially cyclic, even round trip way. That said, I also want to be clear that we are not looking to be the next request response framework here. Uh, rather, we are still very much in the event-driven space. So I'll walk you through some of the main features. Uh, since we're event-driven, we should start with events. Uh, and so event ingresses are how we get data into the system. Uh, this can be anything from a Kafka topic to a message queue to an HTTP server. Just any way of getting data into the system that is then going to trigger the initial functions to begin computation. At the core, as I mentioned, are our stateful functions, and so this is where you build up your business logic. They are distributed across uh, the Flink runtime and can communicate in arbitrary ways. Uh, if you're familiar with actor programming, this does share some similarities. However, there are a few very significant differences. The first is that all functions have locally embedded state, and so this is the thing that Apache Flink does really well. Uh, you are always when inside a function, when it's performing some computation, you're always working with local state in local variables. No network. The next is that for both state and messaging, we are still able to provide the exactly once guarantees you expect out of a modern stream processor. So in the case of failure, we can roll the whole state of the world, both state and messages, back in a consistent manner, such to simulate completely failure-free execution. 
And the whole thing is no database required. So if you've used Flink in the past, this is very much our way of doing things. I'm not simply saying that we've built this new API and it's really hiding that old architecture I described a few slides ago. But you're really truly working with local state that is thread local, and we're managing the fault tolerance through Flink's uh, proven distributed asynchronous snapshots. Finally, you got to get data out. Uh, of course, these functions can do whatever they like, make an RPC call and so on. But if you'd like a way of communicating with the outside world that is tied into our fault tolerance, uh, for that we supply event egresses. Now, the other really key way in which this is different from an actor system is this concept of logical or virtual instances. So imagine we have two shards. Uh, these would be task slots inside of Flink. Uh, I'm not simply saying that we are allocating a bunch of functions, a bunch of objects across these two shards, and they're going to start messaging, messaging each other. Uh, that's a very simple model to reason about, but it's not very efficient. What I want you to do is instead model every entity as a function. So we're, a function will only consume memory if it is being used. If it is not actively being invoked, it will consume no memory, use no threads, have no resource footprint at all. Uh, instead of having, say, one function to model inventory inside of a business, have a function for every item in inventory. Model every single customer in your system as its own individual function that you can message when you want to update its state. So let's look at an example. Let's say that we have a number of functions and C wants to message K. K may or may not be actively used in memory at that moment. We will transparently load it into memory, potentially evicting another. I apologize, there's a little uh, animation from PowerPoint that didn't translate over. Uh, potentially evicting D in this case. And then we will go ahead and invoke K as if it were always available. From your point of view as a user, it is as if you have an infinite number of functions always available in memory ready to use. When you go to message a function, uh, you're always sending it to an address, where that address is made up of some function type and an identifier. Think of your function type as being very similar to a class in an object-oriented language, right? What sort of function do you want to message? where the ID is the particular instance. Uh, and because everything is logical here, there's no service discovery required. You can simply message a function, and your uh, record is guaranteed to get to the right place. So let's say we have a very simple Hello World example, right? We, have, we want to greet users, but specifically we want to do it based on how many times they've been seen so far. So we might say hello and then welcome back, and then third time's a charm, things like that. And what that means is we need to keep track of the number of times each user has been seen by the system so far, also known as state. So we might create a greeter function type, right? And have one instance for every single user that interacts with our system. So this would be our router. And this is the thing that we're going to attach to our ingress and say for each record, how do you send it to that initial function to begin computation? Uh, so we'll get each record and we will create an address based on the greeter function type. So this is the sort of function I want to go to and our user ID, this particular one. And then forward that message on. And we could send this to any number of functions. Once we are inside the function itself, uh, we can do pretty much anything we like. So perform some local computation, work with our states, maybe message any number of other functions, uh, send something to an egress, right? output it to the outside world. Even some more complex things like send a message with a delay that might be a timer or callback. Uh, even make an asynchronous request in a way that it is registered with the framework so it happens uh, tied into our fault tolerance. And so here's our greeter. And while this isn't a lot of code, it's actually doing some very interesting things. The first of which is defining our function type, right? So this is the way that we reference it when we want to message this function. The reason that we do it this way as defining this function type object with a string based name as opposed to referencing the Java class itself is because uh, these applications are built up of bundles of functions known as modules. Right? And any function 
can message any other even across modules. So say we have multiple teams developing in parallel, they're writing their own code, and they are only ever going to be deployed together at runtime. By doing it this way, you can define an interface and say, hey, I have this function that you're allowed to message in this way, but you don't have to see the code, right? I don't have to know at runtime what is backing that function. Even more interestingly, let's say we had a machine learning use case, right? So we have our data engineering team that is building up feature vectors and they like doing that in Java. But then the data science team wants to build a model to score that in production. Well, they probably want to do that in Python. So we can write two different modules in different languages, and because we've defined our function type in this way, we can message across the language barrier transparently. You just message the data science team's function, the fact that it's Python makes no difference to you. Next thing we can do is have a persisted value. And so this is our local state. Uh, we can have any number of these within a given function, and it is always scoped to the current address. Right, the function type and ID. So in this case, we are counting the number of times each user has been seen individually. Right, Every single user has their own count. And then we'll go inside of invoke. Right, So this is a message comes in. We call it. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, I can pull out some metadata. So I want to get the user ID. Right, Where am I being invoked at this moment? Uh, and then do something. So I'm interacting with my local state, I'm reading the value, I'm manipulating it, I'm setting it. Again, there is absolutely no network I.O. happening behind the scenes here. We are working with really, truly local data. And then do whatever you like. So in this case, our big impressive computation is printing out a string based on uh, the current counts. And then we can forward that to another function, maybe do some further processing or send it to an egress, and that's what I'm doing in this case. I want to write it out so I can quickly greet my user. Under the hood, uh, these are always logical instances per ID. So even if you have a billion users, if my greeter application gets insanely popular, that does not mean I need to make a billion allocations on the JVM heap. Uh, we very aggressively share objects, and in fact, this framework makes very few allocations after initial setup. Uh, these objects are created transparently, so as an application developer, you don't need to be concerned with the lifecycle. The first time that you message a user, right? I see user B for the very first time ever. I don't have to care that it's the first time. I will just message their function, and it will be as if it has always existed. Uh, we are running on top of the Apache Flink runtime, and so we're taking advantage of being massively horizontally parallel. Uh, we get to do things asynchronously and so on, but we're abstracting all of that away. So from your perspective, everything is single-threaded. You don't need to worry about concurrency primitives and locking and synchronization and all those tricky things. And finally, our messages are very well-ordered. So even though we're doing this in parallel, even though we're doing things asynchronously, if message A uh, sends a message to function B, in fact, it sends three messages, those are guaranteed to be processed by message B in that order, even in the case of failure. The ordering is very strict. So let's try and relate this back to some more traditional streaming concepts. Uh, what might our data flow look like, at least conceptually? Well, it might be something like this, right? If we tried to build out a DAG, we'd have some sources, right? These are our ingresses, and we're sending data to functions. And the big change here is that we are now sending data horizontally. Right? Any function can message back and forth across the middle piece of this data flow until finally it has some output that goes to an egress, and we write it out. These would be our sinks traditionally in Flink. What we're actually doing under the hood is leveraging one of Flink's most powerful features, and that is iteration. So the Apache Flink runtime has for a long time supported iteration or feedback loops in its data flows. This means records do not have to flow in one direction. We can always have a write back to send data back up to the beginning of our stream and be processed again. And we can do this with exactly one semantics. 
So functionally what we're doing here is building an interpreter on top of the runtime that can run your functions. If we take a little peek under the hood, we have what's called our function dispatch operator. This is our interpreter. Uh, it's the midpoint in this uh, graph. And so what happens is records come in that could be coming from an e ingress, per se, and they've been routed somewhere, and so they have an address. And then what happens? Well, we go, we get the Java object on the heap that is associated with this function type. In each individual dispatcher, there is never more than one Java object allocated per function type. So we might get our greeter function. And then we'll load our state from Flink state backends. This is where we uh, store state during execution time. Uh, again, always thread local, always on the machine. We'll invoke that function. We'll store any state updates that you make. And then the result of this, you know, if you output something that is being sent to another function, what happens? It gets looped back around. It goes through our iteration, potentially landing on a function dispatch operator on a different node, right, depending on our key because we're very distributed. Or you wrote something to an egress, so it goes forward out of the DAG. Yeah. The result of, okay, so just to repeat it for the camera, um, what is the result of a function, right? It can be one of three things. It could be nothing, right? I could have made an RPC call that was a black box to the system. It could be one or more, I can output any number of things, messages that I want to send to other functions. So it is not, I'm not outputting a function, I am calling other functions in my system. Uh, and I'm gonna show a more complicated example on the next slide, but you know, my greeter function could then call my, I don't know, my foo function, I, I don't have a good example. Um, and I'm going to say, here's my function type, here's the ID, the instance of my foo that I want to invoke. And what happens, we're gonna take that record, we're gonna tag it with that meta information. We are then going to loop it back around. So it's going to go through our function dispatch again. Based on the ID, the particular function dispatch that we send it to might be on a different physical machine because we are sharding all of this, but that's transparent. And then we'll invoke it and loop back around and do it again, right? It's just a big interpreter. The third option is that I write it to an egress. So a Kafka topic, a database, an HTTP, what, you know, I'm actually outputting this data to the outside world, in which case it goes downstream, it does not loop. So in the second case, you mentioned it's basically a demo that has a message yes. that gives the data to apply the function to all? Yes, so there is an, there's an envelope that says function type, please go here, ID, I want this instance, and payload. Uh, in fact, if you look at the code, it is called envelope. Uh, of course. So, uh, of course, greeting is not a very interesting example. Um, no one is building their business on top of saying hello. However, people are building businesses around ride-sharing apps. Uh, and what we would like to do is build the core of a ride-sharing system. So this is the thing that actually uh, links riders to drivers. When you go on and request a ride, I, you know, how does that happen? Well, we can do this as a stateful function application. Uh, so we're going to have a bunch of different function types. Uh, we're going to have one for drivers, one for passengers, ongoing rides, even a geo-index, because I want to link riders with drivers who are physically close to each other. And for all of this, we're going to have many, many entities, right? I'm going to have an instance of driver for every driver that uses my system, an instance of passenger for every passenger that has my app, and so on. Now, this is not, uh, and as you can see, right, they message each other in really complex ways. So uh, passenger messages ride that then responds back. Uh, they all talk to the geo index. They all do these interesting things. Now, I'm going to try and slide a screen over, and we're going to see if I can do this properly.
Okay. So uh, this is not a theoretical use case. We actually went ahead and implemented this. Uh, I have this nice little UI visualization so you can see the different entities moving around the app. Uh, hand goes up, requests a ride, driver comes to them, they ride to the destination, ride ends. Uh, the full source code for this is in the GitHub repository. Please go check it out. And while I wouldn't say that this is a trivial example by any means, right, there's a lot of edge cases and, you know, if then else, so on. Uh, it is rather simple when you look at the code. We did this all in about uh, 300 lines of user code because at no point do we need to consider things like fault tolerance or consistency or how we message these other systems. Uh, all we're doing here is writing our business logic. The system is making it work. We can also go into the Flink UI and see the data flow that is running this under the hood. Uh, try and scroll up a little bit. And what you can see is that even though we're running this very complex system, right, there's a lot of different functions that are communicating with each other in arbitrary ways, it translates down into this one data flow. And regardless of what you implement, this is always what Flink is going to see. Uh, all the real processing happens in our function dispatcher. So this is our interpreter. And if I go back, if I can do this properly, we have our feedback. And so what happens, data goes from our dispatch operator to our feedback loop, and then uh, the UI doesn't uh, draw it, but it is looping back around and going to our dispatcher again. So let me pull this out of the way. Okay. So I will try to wrap up. Um, so where does this fit in the larger landscape? Um, am I saying that traditional stream processing is going away? Absolutely not. Uh, what I am saying is that for more state-centric applications, uh, stateful functions gives you a better way of building them. So think about things where you're doing lots of coordination. Uh, that ride-sharing app is essentially a large, distributed, consistent state machine. But there's still a good use case for more traditional stream processing, the kinds of things you're doing with SQL today, the kinds of things you're using the data stream API, uh, more event or stream-centric applications. Uh, data comes in, we're doing some preparation, some ETL, some filtering, some aggregations and joins. Even function as a service still has a good place for the occasional spiky uh, stateless computation. So uh, how might these things go back, uh, tie into each other? Uh, looking at our ride sharing application again, uh, we have these different data streams that are coming in. We might do some forecasting and modeling using the data stream API. And in fact, this is how uh, Lyft does all of their real time pricing and weather forecasting is on top of Flink data stream. But then I need to go and actually run my app, right? I need to set up rides and connect riders and drivers. And for that, we'll have a stateful function application. Finally, I need to go and print receipts, right? Write ends, I need to take some metadata and render it as a PDF. That's still a really good use case for a traditional function as a service. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, the code is currently in this repository, but it is uh, actively about to be moved to the Apache Flink repository. Uh, there's also full documentation on our website. Uh, we even have a Twitter handle if you'd like to reach out and ask some questions. Uh, I think we have a few, little time for questions right now. I know my office hours are actually after lunch, uh, but I'll be happy to answer any during lunch as well. Thank you. Hi, so uh, I had a question on sort of like uh, the concept of maybe like triggers mm -hmm. on, on a state. So suppose like in your taxi example, you do not want to send a message unless you have three people who yeah. like signed up or within a certain time frame. So it, how does that sort of concept? Sure. So let me hold in. Let me, okay. So uh, in this case, uh, we will have a ride function, right? And that keeps track of all ongoing rides that might be, uh, and we might have a state that is like setting up the ride. And so what happens as riders get added, right, we'll keep track how many riders are currently a part of this. And we support uh, sending messages with delay 
which is really just a Flink timer under the hood. So I could have a timeout callback that says, if this does not, uh, if we do not get three riders in five minutes, then cancel the ride. And then you'll go back and message all the riders and say, sorry, we canceled your ride. Uh, if you'd like to reschedule, you know, do X, Y, or Z. Uh, with the uh, geo index example, would that uh, store all the state for all the drivers and all the riders in a single kind of function state object, or would that interface with a external database? So, or? Uh, no, every, absolutely everything is Flink state. There is no external database here. Uh, the way that we did this is uh, we essentially broke the map up into cells, and we have one instance per cell, right? So uh, within each function now, we can keep track in Flink state who is in what cell. Uh, and we have some ways of then also messaging you know, nearby cells. If there's no drivers in my cell, let's then expand our search. But uh, the really key thing, I think, for your question is no database. We are always using Flink state. We are always going into our state backend, which is Flink's abstraction for storing state locally. Uh, this can either be in memory or on local disk, but always local, never an external database. And then we manage fault tolerance using the Apache Flink runtime through a process called snapshotting, which is how we do asynchronous distributed snapshots of the state of your application. Uh, this isn't how it works. I, I, I want to preface what I'm about to say with this isn't what actually happens under the hood. But a way you can think about it is if we stop the world, we have all these distributed components. Imagine that we stop the world, we stop doing processing. We don't do that. Just Again, not what happens. And we copied all your local state to, say, S3, HDFS, some distributed uh, resilient location, something highly available. And then in the case of failure, we can always re-download that state and then just start running again as if nothing had ever happened. Looping in from the previous talk, which presented that problem of visualizing end-to-end -end flow, mm -hmm. how do you deal, like, let's say with this, these examples, there's like 10 these functions that message each other, and you want to understand mm -hmm. um, overall like what happens in your application. Um, how, how do you do so, that? So uh, that, that's a problem we're actively discussing. Tracing in any sort of messaging type system is tricky. What we're thinking about, and this may or may not be what we end up doing, but the idea that we're talking about internally is well, you know, we already got this really great system for managing state. You know, I can, we can store hundreds of terabytes of state. Like, that, that isn't an issue. And so maybe you add in an extra function that just kind of is a tracing function and keeps track of the paths that messages have taken, and then you can message that and say, where have you been? And that gives us a way of uh, essentially building up a stack trace, right? Um, well, and if I was just doing a regular Java application, I would get that for free if someone threw a runtime exception. Uh, because we are doing these distributed systems and it is a more flat call stack, we need to keep track of that ourselves. And uh, I guess that's a long way of saying it's not there yet, but it is very high on our priority list. And uh, if you have ideas, I would, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, great, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, for the I guess, how do instances get spun down? I think in the first case where you mentioned RPC, mm -hmm. um, or in the third case, egress, it kind of makes sense that once those calls are made, um, you know, yeah. things go down. But in that kind of middle state where things are going back and forth, then. So, OK, so this is a little diagram of the interpreter, right? So what, hap what is actually happening under the hood is you have these different function types. So uh, in our uh, ride sharing example, there are four. Now, there might be a million entities across the different instances of those, but we have four function types. Under the hood, for each dispatcher, and there's going to be one on each parallel operator. So in the example I showed you, I'm running this Flink application with parallelism 10. That means there are 10 instances of my dispatcher, like physical instances. Inside each of those, there are only ever four allocations, literally ever. And there is one allocation for each type. So I have one driver function, like physical Java object, one passenger physical Java object, and so on. 
so in practice, we very rarely ever have to do allocations at runtime. If you would like to have so many function types that we actually could not keep them all in memory at once, uh, we do some things with weak references that let them fall out of memory and we'll reload them when we need them. But in practice, you're going to grab an object that's already there. Uh, your state is not stored in the instance itself when you're using a persisted value. That is really just a view into Flink's state backend, which again, could be in memory, could be on disk, always local. And so even though I might have a million ongoing rides, I only have 10 instances of my ride Java object on the heap and I don't actually have to worry about spitting them up and down. When I say we load it transparently, what I really mean is we set the proper key for the state backend for the current ride in this case, such that when you access your persisted value, it is going to be reading the state for that particular ride. Uh, there's no actual reading in and out of memory uh, happening. That's actually what I was interested in as well, mm -hmm. the kind of elasticity of scaling up and scaling yeah. down. Yeah. So uh, again, it's a, it's all the Flink runtime. Uh, we made, I believe, one tiny runtime change in Flink to get this to work. It's from a practical point of view, it's a library. Um, in practice, we want this to be a more mature first-class API, so we want this to be on the same level as SQL and data stream as far as where it sits on the stack, not like CEP, which is truly a library you add on top. Uh, but yeah, so scaling, elasticity, all of those things are based on what Flink can provide. So we can make it distributed, we can sort in our state backends, we can make it fault tolerance. Uh, as far as allocations go, again, we make uh, a static number of allocations on startup that is based solely on your Flink configuration. So again, I'm running that example I showed you, parallelism 10, there are four function types. That means that there were literally 40 allocations spread across 10 machines. And that's it. There will never be more allocations. Yeah.